We are effectively living in a world, and it sounds crazy when you put it this way, but it is really true, where 80% of the population is taking a mood-altering, behavior-altering drug at least a dozen times a day, sometimes several dozen times a day. So, and when you know that, you're like, no wonder. Right. No wonder right. we're all crazy. Right, right. I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. My guest today is Max Fisher, reporter and columnist at The New York Times and author of the new book, The Chaos Machine. Max interviewed researchers, psychologists, social media whistleblowers, and executives inside these companies to paint an honest and incredibly damning picture of the current state of social media. From the creation of the Facebook newsfeed to Gamergate to the election of Donald Trump, he traces the origins of our current political shit show to many of the internet's most consequential moments. He argues, quite persuasively, that it's not just social media algorithms that are the problem, but the fundamental design of the platforms themselves, which have literally rewired our brains. Here's Max Fisher. Max Fisher, welcome to Offline. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, So it's hard to know where to begin because uh, I've been doing this show for a year Mm -hmm. and you cover just about everything we've talked about in this fantastic book of yours. Um, A lot of the characters have been guests on this show. Uh, but I think what was really interesting is how much time you spent with mm-hmm. people who have worked at or in some cases helped run companies like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, right. Reddit. Uh, and you basically conclude that social media platforms are one of the most destructive forces in society today, if not the most destructive force. Yeah. Um, and, and this is key. That's not primarily because of their users, but because of their design. Um, exactly. Can you talk a little bit about what led you to that conclusion? So the book started for me as this kind of the same, I think the same question that you're kind of circling around with the podcast, which is how is social media changing us? Mm-hmm. What is it doing to our behavior, to our cognition? How does that change our politics? What are the consequences of that? The fact that it's changing so many people. And it was something that had started for me, I think like a lot of people, like in the back of my head after the 2016 election, when I had this kind of fuzzy sense that social media had done something to play a role in the Trump phenomenon, but I like could not tell you what, it's like it's exacerbating polarization somehow, or there's like weird extremism on it, or there's this hatred of minorities on the platform that seem to align with Trumpism or these troll cultures. But I would have told you at this point, and most people in Silicon Valley, I think, would have told you, even the people who later, like you said, the kind of dissidents who came around and talked to me for the book, would have said that the platforms are just a neutral vessel, like Mm -hmm. at most a neutral amplifier for the things that are out there in the world anyway. And that started to change for me and then become something that feels like, okay, maybe I should actually start taking this a little more seriously. A year after Trump's election with the genocide in Myanmar, Mm -hmm. which of course is this horrible explosion, this very sudden explosion of violence in this country that was partly state-led, but was also partly communal and bottom-up against this minority in the country. And it was there reporting on it. And I was not thinking about social media because I thought it's just a website. It's just an app. Like what effect could it possibly have? But if you were there when this was all happening, it was really obvious that social media was playing some kind of an enormous role, not just in what it was putting in front of people and not just the extremists that it was platforming and what it was spreading, but something about the way it was pulling people in and making them active participants and really making them feel like they wanted to engage in all of this hate that was happening online up to and including the point of acting on that out in the real world. And you would hear it from everybody. And eventually, even the United Nations came out and said, and this still blows my mind that it reached this point. They said that Facebook played a, quote, determining role in the genocide in Myanmar. Even then, I still did not really take it fully seriously enough until a couple of months after that, I started noticing that Basically, everywhere I went to report on other things, I would hear really similar stories, similar stories to the Trump phenomenon or to the Myanmar genocide that all seemed to trace back to Facebook. And I was hearing it from people I was talking to, activists in all sorts of countries, rights groups. And it was this really eerily similar pattern that seemed to be playing out everywhere. And that was when I first started to think, and this is like early 2018, so I think this is when a lot of people who have come on your show and talked to you started to think, There is a clear and consistent pattern in what social media brings out in us as individuals and as societies. There's a clear and consistent pattern in what it does and how it does that. And probably things like the Trump phenomenon, the Myanmar genocide, if it can reach that point, are just the tip 
of the iceberg, and it probably has all these other effects that we're not even aware of because they're not as obvious. And so that was when I started to think, um, nobody really knows the answer to this, to what social media is doing, and it feels really important. So that was when I started trying to figure it out over the next four or five years, partly by doing the kind of, you know, traditional New York Times, the on the ground reporting where you'd find some blow up and then try to retrace step by step, post by post, how it had happened, what role had social media played for people, for the process there, but also working a lot with folks in Silicon Valley who were starting to sound the alarm and also a lot of experts outside of it who were reaching the same conclusion that I was, that I'm sure you were, that a lot of people were, that social media was playing some kind of role in trying to understand it as uh, neuroscientists who were trying to examine its effect on our brain chemistry, social uh, psychologists who were trying to understand, okay, these social platforms are interrupting the process by which we figure out right and wrong. And what effect does that have on our sense of morality, on our sense of what is right and wrong? Um, political scientists who are studying, system analysts who are trying to figure out what the algorithms actually do, and try to, as best I could, pull all of that together in a narrative that would try to answer that kind of question of what it's doing to us. Man, if a, if a genocide in Trumpism or just the tip of the iceberg, we're pretty fucked. Right. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so you write about how most of the people who work at these companies mm -hmm. are very smart, yeah. well-meaning, sure. aware of the, if the problems that mm -hmm. are out there. Um, but you write that walking into Facebook was like walking into a cigarette factory and having executives tell you that they couldn't understand why people kept complaining about the health impacts of the little cardboard boxes that they sold. Why do you think these very smart people yeah. couldn't understand that the real problem uh, with these platforms, which was the design of the platform themselves, right. the fundamental design, not right. like... We're going to fix, we're going to make a little tweak here. We're going to do this. We're going to moderate this content. But the fundamental design was the problem. Why was that invisible to them, do you think? So it blew my mind to encounter that because it was, as you say, it was a lot of really smart people. And it was a lot of people who I knew from my time in D.C. It, it probably people who you knew who were yeah. like really smart, really rigorous minded experts in their field, policy professionals who seem to have this like, cognitive wall where they would give you like I, I don't think that they were lying and I don't think that they were trying to spin me because I would ask other kinds of tough questions and they would say like you know we don't know or this is a really tough policy area to figure out but when it would be that specific question of anything premised in the idea that social media is um, actively manipulating us and changing us that wall that would go up they couldn't acknowledge it I think partly it's just like basic human emotional self-protection. Mm. Um, you don't want to believe that you're participating in, you know, the new cigarettes of our time. Uh, partly it's a lot of Silicon Valley ideology that I think has faded in the years since among the rank and file that says that um, it's actually good for us to rewire humanity because we are like advancing the species into the next stage of human evolution, which is a thing that a lot of people there really sincerely believe. Um, and a lot of it is just is financial interest. These companies pay really, really well. And um, if you want to get through the day at your job there, you don't want to believe that you are, even if your role at the company is something that is positive, even if your role at the company is, is mitigating harms, which a lot of the people I talked to, that was their job. It wasn't juicing the algorithm. It was trying to like reduce terrorist recruitment on it. If you're participating on that, um, you don't want to believe that there's something about your work that is, is kind of fundamentally damaging in a way that you can't fix because you're ultimately just there as a janitor to clean up the messes made by the profit gathering parts of the companies. There's also an explanation that I think hmm. is attractive, not just for people who work in those companies, but for anyone, which is like, okay, anytime you're gonna connect this many people, uh, this is now the new, this is now the new public square. This is how we all interact. It's going to bring a bunch of people together, mm -hmm. um, and some of those people are going to be extremists. They're going to be bad people, just right. like they are in life. Um, we all have good and bad parts to us, and so some of that's going to come out on social media. Some of it's not. And I remember, I think at one point in the book, I think you said it was a London-based executive at Facebook mm -hmm. who was like, "Look." 
all the bad things in the world now happen on a mobile phone. Should we get rid of mobile phones? Yeah. And I think that's bullshit now because I've been doing this series. Get right. it? But if you're just listening to that, you think, well, yeah, that's a, that's a point. Should we right. just get rid of technology and not communicate with each other and not connect with each other just right. because some people are being bad actors here? Right. It makes a certain intuitive sense. And that was, like I said, that was how I thought initially. It's like, look, this is just... A forum, it's just a place where they're gathering people, so the people bring to it whatever's there. But the really important thing that we know now, and frankly, the people who work at these companies, they have the evidence to know it now too, is that the platforms are not actually showing you what your community and your peers and your friends and your family think. That's what it looks like. It is not real life. <laughs> right. It's not. It's <laughs> this not. This is the back to this. Right. <laughs> yeah. right. It's not. It's not real life. And not only that, but it, I mean, it, it's it's very tricky because you look at it and you see posts from real people, and maybe they're people you know, or maybe they're just people who you're aware of. They're in your broader, you know, they're part of democratic politics. They're part of journalism. They're just part of the like online community, and you think that's the world. That's the world being reflected through the platform. So what you are actually seeing are the choices made by the systems on those platforms. They're showing you a tiny percentage of what's on there that these very powerful algorithms have selected and ordered in a specific way to, and this is something they do very deliberately, to manipulate your emotions and to manipulate your cognition to get you to spend more time on the platforms. And they are presented in a way with likes and retweets and these little counters and these little buttons that are meant to set off certain like monkey brain instincts in you that will keep you clicking. So what you are seeing is in fact the choices, the preferences, the di desires of these very sophisticated systems that want just to keep you on the platforms as long as possible. Well, I think that the most persuasive arguments in your book are about how these platforms actually change human behavior. Yeah. And um, you trace the origins of so many social media problems to the creation of Facebook's newsfeed. Yeah. Not just Facebook, but the news feed specifically in September of 2006, uh, which you call Silicon Valley's monolith <laughs> moment. Um, what do you mean by that? My God, you really did read the book. It's, <laughs> it's really nice. Yeah. I really appreciate that. It's a great, I, mean, this, it I was like, this book is written for me. It's, it's written for you. <laughs> and, yeah, that's and right. the listeners yeah. of this series, yeah. for sure. So. There may be four other people, but you're definitely <laughs> on a very short list who it was written specifically for. Um, so that was, yes, that was a moment that... I, really blew my mind and I'll tell you why it's important but it also was like it was very important to me in the book to not get to the algorithms which I know I'm talking a lot about and bringing up because they're so powerful until like halfway through the book because it's easy to think oh it's just the algorithm so if we fix the algorithms the problem will go away and a lot of it is hard-coded in much more basic elements of the platform like the newsfeed which basically originated modern social media as we know it. so before then you go onto your Facebook page and it looked like a MySpace page. It was just your profile, your friend's profile, maybe some posts on it and you would kind of interact with it. The news feed was the first time that you would go onto the Facebook homepage and it would show you a ranked and sorted list of everything that had happened on the platform that you were in some way connected with or maybe not connected with and the platform just thought you might want to know about. And the idea was it would be like this party that would never end that all of your friends were in. But some people hated it because it was also like any Twitch, any like post that you made, any like, any group that you joined would suddenly show up in everyone's feed. So it was like this all seeing eye that maybe people didn't want to be a part of. And as happens on the internet, anytime anything happens of any sort, some people got really mad. And they posted about it in these groups that if you were online at the time, I was in college, I'm sure you remember called like against Facebook or like fuck news feed or like get rid of news feed or fuck you, Mark Zuckerberg. And these groups were some of the very, very first things, ironically, because they're against the company that created this, that went like mega viral. Um, because what happened is anytime someone would join a group, it would pop up on the feeds of all of their friends. And it wasn't just that they would see a lot of it. It was that it tapped into this very specific emotion that Mark Zuckerberg didn't know this, but we now know this, is basically the most powerful emotion on the Internet to engage your attention, which is moral outrage and more a lot of that yeah, right, right, yeah you may have seen it occasionally <laughs> it will appear on twitter there's, there's a lot of righteousness everywhere there's yeah. a lot of rights there was this amazing study that i write about in the book and i, I promise I'll, I'll come back and finish the story um where someone tracked every different kind of word that you could put into a tweet by its emotional valence basically mm. if it was 
uh, angry, sad, happy, left-leaning, right-leaning, and what that would do to engagement. And for the most part, most kinds of sentiment were neutral on engagement. But if you had one word in a tweet that was a called a moral emotional word, which basically means moral outrage. And moral outrage is anything that is, it's not just anger, but it's outrage against a social transgression. It's like calling someone out for cutting line in the bus um, or cutting line to get onto the bus, I guess. I know how buses work. <laughs> Good. Um, that if there was one word, it would increase engagement by 20% for every single word that was in it. And that is something that, again, to take it back to the 2016 election, Trump tweets have a lot of moral outrage in them, which is like, how dare Latinos, you know, how dare Muslims, the Democrats are awful liars. And Hillary Clinton did not use moral emotional words because she was about togetherness, lifting us up, whatever. And that was not something that would go viral. So against Facebook, Facebook is spying on you. These are moral emotional words, so they would just shoot off and go crazy in terms of the engagement that they provoked on newsfeed. If you saw it, you became much likelier to click the little like button on it. And if you click the little like button, maybe you're not really outraged. Maybe you're just like, yeah, sure, I guess I agree with that. But once that gets cycled through all your friends' news feeds and they see, wow, hundreds of people, everybody I know, they're all outraged about that, not only do you feel a compulsion to go along and to click it too, but the way your brain processes these emotions is so powerful that even if you don't really care about newsfeed, you will yourself internally feel outraged. Your brain basically tricks yourself into agreeing with your friends if they feel morally outraged, into feeling the same, into joining in. And these posts started completely overrunning Facebook, um, you know, tens of thousands of shares at a time when that was a crazy number. You say at least 2008, something like that? Yeah, 2000, yeah 2006. 2006, yeah. yeah. You wrote the book, right? This yeah. Is your, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, was, I wrote right here, 2006. So I was like, oh, I don't. I, w I was still not a Facebook person back then. Oh, you really? Well, yeah. Well, it was. You made a wide choice. A I'm, wide choice. I'm an elder millennial, so I was. Uh, I graduated okay. 2003 okay. from college. You were you were on so MySpace? I just I don't even think I was on MySpace. Really? I was oh. like, no, I was using Instant Messenger in college to communicate. Oh, uh, okay. With I, That's I, where I, had, I, was. I had a So you do know how to use a computer? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. I, I had that basic. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Basic, so, so basic you're competent. So. This as a, this is like a pattern that is now very familiar. All of this online outrage that initially was actually a very small proportion of users, and for a lot of users was like superficial, was not real, manifested into real world activity and real mobs of real people gathered outside the Facebook headquarters to say take down newsfeed, which is this incredible demonstration <laughs> of deep the... irony. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, first of all, it's a deep irony. <laughs> And it's a demonstration of this power. And initially, people at Facebook were like, oh, my God, we have to turn this off. But Mark Zuckerberg, who is smart in a very narrow and specific set of ways, right. said, wait a second. This is actually a demonstration of the incredible power of our systems to create all of this engagement. And he was right. And they really leaned into that development. And then all the other platforms copied it. Every platform that didn't have it completely died out. And that was basically the genesis of social media as these mega companies that are now among or if not the largest corporations on earth. I think it's a very important dynamic that we can all relate to, though, mm -hmm. especially now. It, when you see that something's a thing mm -hmm. online that everyone's outraged about, even if you don't, it, it's repetition, right? If you're seeing it enough, mm -hmm. if you're seeing enough people angry about it, um, first of all, your perception is that there's a ton of people angry about it, even if that's not the truth, because right. social media just amplifies right. all, all the people who are angry about it, even if they're a minority. And you either agree with it, or if you don't agree with it, mm -hmm. you still stop and think to yourself, maybe there's some truth to that. Right. There may be truth because there's so many people right. who are mad, and I'm seeing it everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it must be a little... It, that's that's one of the big dynamics I right think, it's there's definitely and there's two there's two studies that come to mind for that there's one that's it's not social media specific it's this famous study where they were looking for or identifying this exact like cognitive loophole where you're talking about where you see something repeated a lot especially if you see it repeated by your peers it feels internally true to you where mm -hmm. they would um, repeat this phrase to people over and over again the internal body temperature of a chicken and if they repeated it enough times they could say any number at the end of it they could say the internal body temperature of a chicken is 300 degrees and people would say yes that's true I, th I think that that's accurate uh, Wild. I, I, yeah we're not we're not actually that good at processing especially if it's in a social context we are really bad at processing information 
And Especially if there's this much information coming at us all the time, all like every single day from a million different sources, which right. is the problem now. Right, right. A million diff- and all of it cycled through this feeling of this like mob gathering to like shout with this one unified voice, this, you know, rumor or this thing that we're all outraged about. Uh, and the, the other study that I wanted to mention that, that comes to mind for me a lot is the this is a, an extension of that moral outrage study about, you know, tweets with moral outrage travel further. They ran a version of this where they would they would pull people to see, like, how outraged are you at the other political party? And people who had low levels of emotional outrage towards the other party, for whatever reason, maybe they're just not an outraged person or maybe they're not politically engaged. If they would send a like fake tweet on this fake Twitter platform that they set up for the experiment that expressed outrage towards the other party and it received a lot of engagement, they would want to post more because they were internalizing that reward. And very quickly after doing that just a few times, their internal sense of outrage towards the other party would have shot way, way up. Their underlying nature would have changed. And the same is true. It, it's easy to hear that with party and think like, well, maybe that's not so bad because the stakes of our politics are really high right now. So, you know, I'm sympathetic to partisan outrage. But that also applies to any sort of in-grouping, outgrouping, for example, religion or race. Offline is brought to you by Blue Moon. With all the brewing techniques and experimental flavors, choosing a craft beer can get overwhelming, especially for Tommy. Yeah, there's a lot of options. A lot of options. But you don't have to be an aficionado to recognize the simply delicious taste of Moon Haze from Blue Moon. Moon Haze is an award-winning hazy pale ale that has the iconic Blue Moon citrus taste with a deliciously bold, slightly hoppy, juicy flavor. Lean into a hazy pale ale brewed with dried whole oranges and crafted with refreshing tropical and slight coconut flavors. Each sip is smooth with just a little bite of bitterness. Again, Moon Haze did win the gold at the 2020 Great American Beer Festival in the category of best hazy or juicy pale ale. Four to five dudes who live in Brooklyn and dress like uh, train conductors choose Blue Moon. <laughs> Don't know what razor is. Get Moon Haze from Blue Moon delivered by visiting get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline to see your delivery options. That's get.bluemoonbeer.com slash offline. Celebrate responsibly. Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado Ale. Offline's brought to you by Public Goods, the one-stop shop for sustainable, high-quality, everyday essentials made from clean ingredients at an affordable price. Everything from personal care and household products to coffee, toilet paper, shampoo, pet food, and more, Public Goods is your new everything store, thoughtfully designed for the conscious consumer. Rather than buying from a bunch of single product brands, Public Goods members can buy all their premium essentials in one place with one beautiful, streamlined aesthetic. Public Goods searches the globe to find clean, healthy, eco-friendly, and innovative products. Uh, You know, they got the shampoo, Mm -hmm. they got the soap, they got the poop bags. We use those. Uh, uh, Love It likes the dinner bowls. I do too. And, you know, knowing what's in your products and where they come from is, of course, important. And public goods ethically source and obsessively develop each of their products to be free of unhealthy ingredients and harmful additives still common on drug and grocery store shelves. They're committed to making their products healthy and safe for humans, animals, and the environment. And they use a membership model to keep costs low and pass on even more savings to their customers. Best of all, you can make your first purchase with no obligation. Join hundreds and thousands of others who switch to their new everything store. Uh, we've worked out an awesome deal for our listeners. Receive 20% off your first public goods order. I recommend trying their poop bags. That's what I recommend trying. Get some of those poop bags for your for your pet or for yourself. Just go to publicgoods.com slash offline or use code offline at checkout. That's P-U-B-L-I-C-G-O-O-D-S dot com forward slash offline to receive 20% off your first order. Offline is brought to you by Haya. Typical children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. Filled with two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk growing kids should never eat. But, you know, we did as kids. I had those. Uh, we, we know what those vitamins were called. Had yeah, them all the time. Named after a certain show. They tasted great. Yeah, they tasted great. Well, but they, they were, were bad. They, they were t- a lot of chemicals. A lot of, chemi- a lot of sugar. That's why Haya was created. The pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full-body nourishment our kids need with the yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. It's non-GMO, vegan, dairy-free, allergy-free, gelatin-free, nut-free, and everything else you can imagine. Charlie takes these vitamins which is good because he needs all kinds of vitamins because, like, are you going to get all the vitamins you need just by eating mac and cheese all day? Probably not. No. 
Probably it's not. Really tough. Which is why he has Haya, and he likes it, and it's good for him. There you go. We've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com slash offline. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash offline and get your kids the full-body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. You make the argument that I've heard from so many offline guests, which is that the Mm. single most powerful force in social media is identity. Yeah. Um, Which I think is so important because it gets mixed up now in our politics. Well, it's very connected now to our politics, to extremism, to everything else. Can you talk about why that is and why that's become so harmful? Because, you know, I think the perception is like, why should identity be harmful, right? Like. It's it allows us to express ourselves to, uh, for to to talk to people like us to connect with people who are like us. Like, right. why has identity become right. such a divisive and destructive force in social media? Right, and it's a good point that identity in itself is not only is it not a bad thing, but it's important basically for our emotional well being. We need a sense of identity and a sense of community to just like cope with the world day to day. The reason that the refraction of identity through social media has been so damaging is um, is twofold. I'm going to try to remember the second half while I tell you about the first. The first is that just like with moral outrage, the form of identity engagement that really works on social media and therefore that the platforms, and this is all of the platforms, will push over and over again is something called either outgrouping or identity threat. And it's this idea that your in group, and that might be your political party, that might be race, religion, it might be something smaller like your local community, or it might be um, moms who are concerned about the health of their kids, is under threat from some external outgroup that is coming to get us. And that's really powerful because it taps into these deep, evolutionarily ingrained instincts that we have as these like tribes that we evolved in to try to defend ourselves against external threats. It's like this alarm bell that goes off off in our head. So when that gets activated, it makes us really, really engaged with the platforms. It makes us want to spend a lot of time on it, uh, raising the alarm about the threat, organizing against it. So that is the form of identity time and time again that you see get amplified. And again, with, with political party, it's easy to kind of dismiss that because, you know, our politics are like that anyway, so it's trickling down. But you see other forms of that, like one case that I spent a lot of time in the book because it was this kind of like early case that I think showed us a lot of what was coming was um, anti-vaccine mm. sentiment, where a form of identity that is really prevalent but is not particularly engaging online because it's not threatened, it doesn't have that sense of outgrouping and identity threat, is just um, moms, moms of young kids. That, like that was a community that was online early, and you talked to Renee Deresta, so you know about this. Yeah. A community that was really online really early because you're on message boards, you're on Facebook trying to find tips for uh, raising your, your young child or your infant. And what the platforms learned, and by this I mean the systems, not the people working there because they had no idea what their systems were doing and they still don't really know. The systems learned is that if you're a mom and you search for parenting tips or child health and it shows you, you know, some basic tips, you're not going to spend very much time online. But if it shows you a conspiracy theory that says that the vaccines that doctors are giving you for your kids are uh, going to spread autism, are going to actually give them disease instead of preventing it, that that is very engaging, not just because it's a scary conspiracy, but because it creates this sense of identity threat that we moms collectively are under siege by, uh, you know, Soros, vaccines, doctors, Bill Gates, whatever it was. And it sounds crazy that that would spread very widely. And 10 years ago, you would not have said that it would, but it has spread so widely in the platforms because they become very sophisticated at inching people into it, at kind of recommending in small incremental versions of it until you get this much larger community of not just moms, but anti-vaxxers. And of course- So it starts with just asking questions and exactly. you know maybe vaccines are fine, but maybe did you see this one study where blah, 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 and then right. it gets you into the next and then it gets you into the next. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's questions and we're not sure. And that's really engaging because if you're trying to figure out, well, are vaccines safe? That's a reason to spend a lot more time online, which is how the platforms learn to push it. So that's one reason that identity threat has been something that has been really damaging on the platforms or that the platforms have used a really damaging effect because it galvanizes these kind of identity groups against these causes that might not be real or might be very damaging for us socially. Look, I think 
one challenge with sort of persuading most people that this is what's going on is mm -hmm. a lot of people think, okay, uh, some of these extremists are just easily brainwashed people. They're idiots. I can't be right. brainwashed. I'm one, I'm one of the smart like ones. This. I'm one of the smart ones. So right. the anti-vaxxers, something's got to be going on there. Right. I would never do that. But I think even like finding information about the pandemic over the last two years. Absolutely. And I am someone who like covers this. I want, we did our Pod Save America and I'm also like a hypochondriac by nature. So right, I was a little nervous about it. I like dug deep into COVID. Yeah. And what I, what I found over the last two years is, is like, it's just so much easier to find mm -hmm. extremes, not just on the anti-vaxxer right side, right. but on the other side too. Yeah. Um, yeah. That like, it, it's really tough to, it, even if you're digging into these platforms, even if you're like trying to follow people who mm -hmm. have the best credentials mm -hmm. to really, f anything that is nuanced or complicated, no. you're not gonna find, Don't if that's it. the answer. If right. the answer is any kind of nuance or complication, right. you're not gonna be able to find it. You only find the extremes. You find the extremes and you find blame, especially. And sometimes yeah. that's appropriate. Sometimes that's yeah. right, and sometimes social media can Which be really Which makes it even diff more difficult. Right, exactly. And that was why I wanted to spend, I mean, I spent a lot of time with the extreme, you know, the anti-vaxxers, Pizzagate, QAnon, all right, these kind of extreme cases. But I also wanted to talk about Exactly this, this idea that we, even those of us who might be the kind of person who would pick up a book on social media and think of ourselves as kind of above it, are affected by it, but in degrees and in ways that might not be as obvious because we're not out there denying vaccines for our kids. There's one study that I write about where they asked people in two groups, one group keep using social media and another group they said deactivate Facebook, not all social media, just the Facebook app on your phone for four weeks. And it, it was really hard to get them to do that because we don't want to turn it off. We, we have a hard time turning it off. But when they got that group, this really large group to turn it off, and they would kind of over those four weeks study what was happening with them, the one thing that is not going to be surprising is they reported much higher life satisfaction at the end. They were just happier because they weren't spending time on these platforms that do, in fact, make us miserable. And we all kind of know that it makes us miserable. And in fact, they found that the increase in happiness and life satisfaction was equivalent to about a third the effect of going to therapy. Wow. Which I know. <laughs> I know. So if you're spending money a on a cheaper. therapist, it's a lot cheaper than going to a therapist. Yeah. Um, but the other thing they found that I, I felt really important to me was that people who deactivated Facebook, whatever their political affiliation, completely regardless of it, they were significantly less polarized in terms of how they viewed, not necessarily overall because just four weeks, but any issues that had come up in those four weeks, any issues that had become salient in the news or kind of salient in society, they were less polarized than people who stayed on Facebook, equivalent to... 50% of the overall increase in polarization in American life over the past 25 years. Which, so it's funny, I do, um, there's another podcast I do called The Wilderness, which is about the Democratic Party, sure. and so I just finished a bunch of focus groups, mm -hmm. and I specifically wanted to talk to voters who turned out in 2020, but do not follow politics closely, right. which, by the way, as is most is voters. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so not just most Americans, but of, of the voting population, mm -hmm. it's like 20% of the people who are like us, who are right. following politics super closely, 80% are not. And people like us who follow politics closely would look at these voters and be like, oh, why are they all so moderate seeming? <laughs> but part of it is that they don't pay attention right. as closely to stuff. And so that they, they have strong opinions on issues. Mm -hmm. Some of them like believe strongly in in progressive ideals sure. and talk that way but they don't talk in a way that we all talk and right. they're in, in that in that polarized way because God they're not them. following it right. as closely but conversely their views of politics are those people are all fucking crazy in politics because they're all yelling at each other all the time and they're screaming on facebook yeah. and there's less trust in institutions right. because the institute what they're getting reflected from the media and politics is a bunch of people who are extremely polarized and yelling online all the time that's a great point it's the the political class is also the very online class at this point and when people outside of it look at that they're partly they're saying the uh, nature of the political class but they're also just seeing the nature of what it is to be very online and very engaged and it's a reminder i think that so much of our politics now 
are refracted through social media, even though obviously there are a lot of other venues for it, that there's so much political activity now that happens online. Even if it's just people like us, the political class being online, it affects you so strongly that that filters through the entire system. Yeah. Um, you talked about extremism, and I thought it was fascinating how uh, you mentioned Gamergate. Yeah. You basically drew, draw like a line from Gamergate to, to MAGA <laughs> to, to January 6th. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, can you sort of like trace that, like the rise of the alt right and why it started with Gamergate? And just for people who, who who might be listening who don't know what Gamergate is, can you just talk about that a little? First of all, if you don't know Gamergate, bless you. Turn off the podcast right now. Honestly, and don't. Honestly, like until I started the series, I didn't really know Gamergate, and yeah. it wasn't until I dug into your book that I'm like, okay, now I, I somehow in 2014 I missed Gamergate. Good for me. It was. It, <laughs> it did actually. It came at this kind of fascinating moment. It was right at the end of the era when. There was like just the internet when we like I dismissed at the time and thought like this is just it's just people online it's just like crazy nerds who were just going nuts and people who were affected by it were trying to warn us and in some people in some cases trying to warn me specifically this is about a much bigger shift in our politics so what GamerGate was was um, 2014 right yeah okay um, a ex- an explosion of this conspiracy theory whose origins are, are very convoluted and frankly not actually important to where it comes out, that uh, game developers were in league with the gaming media in a conspiracy... It's ridiculous. I know, I know. I know, and I know. It's completely As most ridiculous. conspiracies are when you explain them, yeah. Yeah, right, right. Uh, we're in league with uh, the gaming industry and the gaming media to... Um, basically marginalize young white men on behalf of feminism and they were going to change gaming to take out all traditional masculine portrayals they were going to make you play games with women characters and lgbt characters and this was a and now it might start to sound a little more familiar this was a conspiracy by the elite and a war on men to keep down and suppress men and this is something that started on 4chan and reddit and it, if you remember it you probably remember it because it culminated in this really horrifying harassment campaign against basically any woman involved at any point in the gaming industry or the gaming press. But what was really significant about it was that it it started as this like nutso conspiracy, but it got picked up by these platforms, especially Reddit and especially YouTube, that identified it, their systems identified it as something that was going to be really, really powerful at hooking people in because of this idea of identity threat and cultivating this sense of identity that hadn't really existed before, of you're a gamer, and that's not just someone who plays video games, but that is who you are, it's your community, your identity, and it is under attack by these nefarious forces. And that was something that, because that's a conspiracy theory that if you could at all relate to that identity was engaging to you, you would spend a lot of time on YouTube and Reddit clicking on it, and that meant that the platforms would push it up more and more. So if you were on these platforms at all, which a lot of people were in 2014, it was something that you would be exposed to over and over again until the point that it would feel real. And that was also something that gave rise to Milo Yiannopoulos and a lot of people who are now quite familiar to us as the alt-right. And in fact, a lot of alt-right and far-right and neo-Nazi websites identified this. And they said, these are our people. This is a, re- this is a recruiting pool for us unlike we have ever had before. And sure enough, the platforms, their automated systems also made that connection. And they realized that someone who had spent a lot of time in Gamergate, they might also like a video about how the white race is under threat. And they might also like a video about how the Democrats and the feminists are part of a a conspiracy to keep down white people and to keep down men. That might engage them. Nobody at Silicon Valley wanted to promote the alt-right, but that was what their systems arrived at and cultivated this much larger community that became the kind of the Pepe's, you know, the online alt-right that then identified Trump when he was very obscure, when he was not someone who had much of a base uh, out in the world as kind of their guy because he, like so many things that then dovetail with this movement, spoke to the uh, the incentives of the platforms and what rose on them. And so they all got pulled together into this kind of bigger mishmash identity and community that we're now all living with. Yeah, I think it, it it's obvious now, but I think it's underappreciated how much Trump's personality aligns perfectly with yes. what these platforms incentivize to get people to engage with them. Right. Just perfect. Right. And it's it, it's something you see over and over where it's someone who might be kind of obscure, but they just their personality where 
I mean, with Trump, it's outrage, it's provocation, it's insults, and especially it's us versus them. And just the fact that he's just got poster brain where he's just posting constantly and it just whatever will be like the issue of the day. How can it be a little bit more provocative, a little more extreme on it? You see in place after place, the people who have this personality will just rise, will just rocket on the platforms. And I think when that first started to happen, it was easy for a lot of us to make the mistake to say, oh, he's a master manipulator of social media. He's got Steve Bannon. He's got the dark arts. Breitbart has the dark arts. They understand how all this stuff works. But it turns out that they were really just passive beneficiaries of the preference of the preferences of the platforms who identified that this would be really engaging to other people and would help create these communities that would keep people online and clicking and clicking. Well, I thought one of the most like shocking examples of this in the book was about Charlottesville. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Which is, again, I think some of the social media companies might say, yeah, sure. Charlottesville was organized Mm -hmm. because there were these platforms where like-minded extremists came together Mm -hmm. and said, all right, let's all meet up and do this. But um, you talked to or you interviewed uh, Jonas Kaiser, who's a Harvard researcher. And um, he basically comes to the conclusion that Charlottesville was created through the YouTube and Facebook algorithms. Right. Yes. It's I think it's I think it might be. It occurs in like the last third of the book. I think it might in some ways be like the most important thing in the book. And this is, Jonas is kind of the person who like first really pushed this, but other people have since come to it, which is just important to say that there's other supporting evidence for it. And this was the the second form of identity threat that I remember I'd wanted to talk about is that the platforms will figure out how to take these pre-existing communities that are not connected to each other. And this is what happened in Charlottesville. We had all of these little right-wing, far-right, neo-Nazi, KKK groups that had never really come together. And it started with, in the case of Charlottesville, the Facebook group's recommendation system, where it realized that if you were part of one of these groups, you might be interested in these other groups. And not just that, but if the system routed you through all of these groups in a specific sequence, and if it pushed you from one to the other frequently enough, it would create an entirely new super community this like much larger kind of miasma or swirl. And this is also what happened with um, QAnon. It's mm. basically how QAnon came about. That could then be much larger and then would take on the ideas of all of this. And this in this first network analysis that found this, it all centered around this Unite the Right rally that became the Charlottesville rally that brought together all of these groups. And of course, there are a lot of reasons that the far right was resurgent then. Donald Trump being president was not irrelevant to it. But it was the thing that... Like you said, the the answer was that, oh, the groups came together on the platforms. They were really brought together by the platforms. And this is something that Jonas found happening in, he looked at three different countries and he found the exact same pattern happening in every single country where it would be a lot of, it would pull in a lot of communities who were, were fine, basically, like center-right people, people who just like to watch the news online, people who might have interests that were like vaguely aligned with right-wing cultural politics, but were not themselves extremists. Mm. And that it would determine that it could link all of those together to create this much larger community that would get people to watch for seven hours a day instead of 40 minutes a day because it's exposing them to all these ideas that are more extreme and therefore more engaging. And that it would create this sense of a new community around them. And especially, and it did this over and over again, at the kind of center, the center of gravity of these networks, the places where it would inevitably lead people. And then once there, it would keep showing them more and more content, more and more videos and more and more Facebook groups. It was always the most extreme iteration of it. It was always the extreme far right. If it was health misinformation, it was always um, extreme vaccine deniers or people telling you to go out and kill doctors. Uh, and with QAnon, it was the thing that brought in all of these right wing groups who previously never would have believed in this kind of thing or arrived at it around this crazy conspiracy theory that became the uniting force for this entirely new identity and community that was built on and by the platforms. Offline is brought to you by Katherine Heigl's Badlands Ranch Superfood Complete Dog Food. Why are so many dogs suffering with health issues? Mm. Well, actress Katherine Heigl, who's helped save over 16,000 dogs through her foundation, says she's seeing more issues with dogs' weight, joints, odors, and digestion oh, man. than ever before. So after doing a ton of research, she felt like there was one place we can look to improve any dog's health, their food. So she decided to create something she could actually feel good about feeding her pups. It's called Superfood Complete. 
Superfood Complete is made with 34 of the healthiest proteins, vegetables, superfoods, adaptogens, omegas, and prebiotics on the planet. It also helps support the Jason Debus Heigl Foundation, which has helped rescue over 16,000 dogs and place them in loving homes. That's so nice. Dogs everywhere are trying this food and experiencing amazing health changes. Host personal experience. I mean, I love the food. I've, I had some. I thought it was d- delicious. Pundit was wolfing it down the other day. Yeah, Pundit was. And, and Leo's had it too. And uh, they seem happy. Yeah, they're very they seem dogs. happy and uh, and healthy, which is great. If you want your dog to experience all the incredible changes healthy superfoods can provide and you want to save up to 44% off, go to mydogfoodguide.com slash offline. That's mydogfoodguide, G-U-I-D-E dot com slash offline and order right now. They even offer a 90-day return policy, so there's no reason not to try it. Go to mydogfoodguide.com slash offline. Your dog will thank you. Offline is brought to you by Fume. Smoking is a nasty habit. Easy to start, hard to stop. For those of us that have gotten hooked on tobacco, why don't I say us, I haven't, or vaping and are trying to cut down on the habit or eliminate it entirely, there's Fume. Fume is the natural inhaler designed for a better, safer, and natural way to quit cigarettes. It's no smoke, no vape, and no nicotine. It's a no smoke, no vape, and no nicotine replacement for the hand-to-mouth habit of smoking. Anyone that's tried to quit knows that it often helps to replace a habit than to quit it cold turkey. Fume handcrafts wooden inhalers and uses cores infused with plant oils studied to curb cravings. They have flavors like peppermint and conquer. Conquer. (laughs) Okay. Go forth and. With minty notes to simulate menthol cigarettes and other flavors like cozy chai. And Lemonberry Bliss for a sweeter experience. Cozy chai. Cozy. Sounds cozy. All of their flavors are 100% natural, no harmful chemicals, no artificial flavors, and absolutely no nicotine. Quitting is tough, but Fume can really help. They've got thousands of five-star reviews from smokers who've tried everything else until this worked. I gifted Fume to someone that had uh, quit cigarettes by switching to vaping, thinking it was safer, and now is replacing his vaping habit with the Fume inhaler. Good. Those vape companies are a bunch of assholes. Assholes. Their wide range of flavors makes it easy to find something that works to satisfy whatever you're craving, plus the fact that the inhaler doesn't produce smoke or vapor means you can take it with you to places where cigarettes or smoking products aren't allowed, like most bars and restaurants and even airports and planes. Whether you're a smoker or ex-smoker who still struggles with cravings, Fume is the perfect tool for you. Head to breathefume.com slash crooked and use promo code crooked to save 10% off your entire order. That's 10% off your entire order when you head to b-r-e-a-t-h-e-f-u-m dot com slash crooked and use code crooked. Offline is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Shopify gives entrepreneurs the resources once reserved for big business. So upstarts, startups, and established businesses alike can sell everywhere, synchronize online and in-person sales, and effortlessly stay informed. Scaling your business is a journey of endless possibility. Don't we know it? Crooked Media started out selling uh, just a few t-shirts, and today we're selling uh, a bunch more t-shirts. And uh, and we got some coffee. And we got some shoes, shoes, got some new shoes. we got some sweatshirts, T-shirts. we got some hats. And we're not stopping there because success is a million milestones on a forever evolving path, which is a line that Lovett says all the time. Like our Shopify powers millions of businesses from first sale to full scale. Reach customers online and across social networks with an ever-growing suite of channel integrations and apps, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and more. Gain insights as you grow with detailed reporting on conversion rates, profit margins, and beyond. More than a store, Shopify grows with you. This is Possibility powered by Shopify. Go to shopify.com slash offline, all lowercase, for a free 14-day trial and get full access to Shopify's entire suite of features. Grow your business with Shopify today. Go to shopify.com slash offline right now. Shopify.com slash offline. So get get to the point where it's like, so what do we do about all this, right? <laughs> I mean, one of the great frustrations I have had um, doing this series mm-hmm. is that the more I learn about social media, uh, especially from your book, the less I am confident yeah. that we can ever yeah. effectively govern these platforms, even if we had a functioning political system, which right. we, of course, don't. Right, which we don't. Um, and that's not just with regulation, or even if we had uh, social media platform companies mm-hmm. that wanted to do something about this in, in a real systemic way. Right. Um, because it just seems like, and you know, like I, I talked to um, Alex Stamos, um, who worked at Facebook and sure. was a security guy at Facebook. And, you know, he, he sort of pushed back on me when I was like, well, it's the algorithms and can you tweak the algorithms? And I don't think he, now that I have read your book, I don't think it was pushing back on me like, 
um, it's not the algorithms, they're fine. I think he, what he was saying is like a tweak here and there to the algorithms is right. not actually going to fix all of these problems right. because the real answer is they're far more fundamental than exactly. just tweaking the algorithms, which these platforms in the last couple years have been, or at least some of them have been trying to do. Sure. Yeah. And there, there are people at the companies who are trying, like you said, to push the algorithms in a better direction. But it is, it's a little bit like saying, well, what if we change the filter? on the cigarettes, but we kept trying to sell as many cigarettes as possible. Or like, what if we did a different kind of menthol, but we're also gonna like really ramp up our cigarette advertising budget? Because the entire idea of the product of maximizing engagement through technology, we just know it just taps into these really deep and really destructive impulses. So I, I do have an answer for, it's not a super satisfying answer, but for like, what what do we do question. Yeah, yeah. Do you want the, do you want the like what we do as a society or what we do as individuals? Answer? I was going to ask you both. You both? Okay. So yeah, so okay. perfect. <laughs> okay, well, we'll start with the society one because it's a it's a it's a dream. So we might as well start with the um, yeah. When I whenever I would ask people who studied this really seriously, um, what you know, if you were in charge of Facebook for a day, if you had all the power in the world, what is the change that we make? And it was always some version of turning it off. Which I, right, like, good luck with that. Not necessarily the entire platforms. A lot of these people still love social media and are still real believers in its potential for and actual evidence of positive changes mm -hmm. brought about by social media. But the engagement maximizing aspects of it, whether it's um, the algorithms, even Jack Dorsey at Twitter, he was before he left, he was like, maybe the idea of showing you retweets, a little number at the bottom of a tweet, that might be really destructive. And maybe we need to get rid of that. And that was something that I would hear people say to get rid of. But it was always just these features that are meant to maximize engagement and hook you in. If you just turn those off, and if we go back to that pre-2006 social media, it, it really is at that point more of a neutral amplifier. Now, how do you actually get that to happen, I, I don't know. I, you know, good luck to you. That'll have to be your next guest. We'll have to answer that. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think that uh, it, it, it's interesting to imagine like a, a version of a social media platform that mm -hmm. could connect people in a positive way. It's right? because like underlying all of this is like there's it's not our fault, but there's something there's a weakness in our Absolutely. composition as humans yes. that's allowing this to happen. Yes, and so it's a pretty it's a pretty dark view to be like, well, we just all can't be connected in this way or in any big way because we're all just going to be at each other's throats. Right. And so, and they, so I always was trying to flip it and think like, is there a way to connect a billion something people around the world in a way that's healthy and positive? Sure. I mean, that like that pre newsfeed social media, people spent a lot less time on it. It was a lot less powerful, but it just it did not pull out those same destructive yeah. forces. It did not hook into those those kind of cognitive weak points, those instinctive weak points that you were talking about, and exploit them in the same way because it was something that was that really was a much more neutral vessel in terms of what it showed you. Maximizing for engagement seems like the original sin. That's right. That's right. Um, so what can we do individually? So this is I think the harder question and it's partly because like the the answer I know that you hear a lot on your podcast is like, well, just turn off your phone for 18 hours a day. And it's like, OK, that's, <laughs> it's not really an option no. for me. And that's that's both because like for work, I need a lot. But it's also just like we live in a world where these social media companies have really captured and control information consumption and news consumption, how we relate to other people. So if you want to do those things, which you should want to do because they're basic human needs, then I'm sorry, but you need to be online occasionally you need to have your phone on and a uh, phone diet is a great idea but it's not a solution and it, even if it is something you can do it's not really a solution because so many of social media's effects are atmospheric even if you did throw your smartphone in the trash the world around you is still profoundly influenced by social media mm -hmm. and you have to live in that world that filters back to you through your friends you're affected by it even if you are not on facebook or on twitter or on instagram yourself so what can you actually do as an individual when you were living in that world? And the answer that I arrived at, and it is going to sound both pat and convenient, but I promise I have a good explanation for why it is helpful, is to understand as deeply as you can what it does to you. And the reason that I, that's something that I came to by the end of the book. The reason that I came around to that is the answer is that social media really, really does operate. And this was stressed by every 
behavioral psychologist, every neuroscientist who I talk to, it operates like a drug. It operates not just metaphorically, but it creates a specific chemical reaction in your brain that is addictive. And not only is it addictive, but like any drug, it changes your behavior mm -hmm. and it changes the way that your brain works. But it's especially pernicious as a drug because its effect is invisible because you don't realize you're taking a drug when you're on Facebook. You think that you're just chatting with your friends or reading the news or whatever. And it's also pernicious because whereas, say, alcohol's effect is uh, hormonal, so it might affect your... Um, your balance, your temper, things like that. Social media's drug-like effect is on your social instincts and your social behavior, which is not something that we are used to recognizing as a drug-like effect and changing how we think about right or wrong and changing how we think about our identity. That's not something that we normally associate with that, so we don't spot it. But it is a drug, and it's one that we're taking. Um, I think it's like 80% of Americans are taking it an average of about a dozen times a day. I think that's the median number. And if you're politically engaged like us, it's sometimes several dozen. And if you're a young person and your social needs are a lot higher, it's probably also several dozen. So we are effectively living in a world, and it sounds crazy when you put it this way, but it is really true, where 80% of the population is taking a mood-altering, behavior-altering drug at least a dozen times a day, sometimes several dozen times a day. So and when you know that, you're like, no wonder. Right. No wonder right. we're all crazy. Right. Right. No wonder the world is like this. Right. It does. And it, of course, it does explain everything, but it does explain a lot. And it really is as if uh, and I'm going to sound like that guy in Dr. Strangelove, but it really is as if there is something in the water yeah. that is changing all of our behavior that we're not aware of, that we don't see. And so that's why in the way that, you know, you can take drugs, you can drink safely. Right. I had two cups of coffee this morning. I'm probably going to have two glasses of wine tonight. And I can take those safely because I understand their effect on me, on my behavior. I understand what I can do and can't do safely with them. And I know how to differentiate the drugs or the alcohol's effect on me from what I actually want to do. And I think if you can see that when you're on social media and you can see, okay, the outrage I'm feeling, it feels like it's coming from within, but that's actually the effect of the drug and the effect of this training that is being induced upon me by these very powerful companies, I think it becomes, it doesn't remove the effect, but it becomes much easier to manage it and to live with it and to know how, and this will depend on each of us and our individual personality and what we want, how to kind of cope with having that be a part of our life because it's going to be a part of your life in a way that is uh, a little more responsible and a little safer for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I do not think that answer was pat at all because that is the conclusion I've come to personally after doing this series through doing this series mm -hmm. and you know a lot of my friends and people who know me were like oh so are you not using social media anymore are you throwing away your phone because you did offline and they'll make fun of me when i'm still on my phone a lot um which is all warranted but it's i i haven't changed i have changed a little bit of how much time i'm on my phone but sure. i've changed how i sort of view mm -hmm. the political world and everything else and my behavior and my socialization with other people right because i know what's going on right and now it is tough and you've mentioned this a couple times like being in politics i still very much believe and and you've written about it in this book that the threat from right-wing extremism mm -hmm. is quite real yeah right and when i when i go on pod save mary and we talk about this we talk about the threat to democracy posed by trump and there and and a lot of the republican party right now i genuinely believe it and i don't think it's just something that social media is making me think right but <laughs> i am also much more wary now mm -hmm. when i'm looking at something online or i'm scrolling through twitter and people are getting outraged about something or everyone's taking it up to an 11 or everyone's freaking out. Is it real? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How much is based in reality? How much is just this, the algorithm and everyone just getting, you know, the, the effects of social media. It is something that I'm a little, I'm a little more attentive to now. Right. And, and, and the real struggle is trying to figure out, I mean, this is what social media does. What is real? What are the real threats? What right. should we genuinely be worried about? And what is the social media bullshit? Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. It's about learning how to differentiate, and not just what you see out in the world. It's about learning how to differentiate the emotions that you feel internally, because social media is so effective at drawing this out so that in a way that it doesn't feel like it's coming from Facebook, it feels like it's coming from within. And when you can see 
okay, this is something that Twitter has trained me to like feel really outraged about this. It becomes, I think, easier to live with and to not feel crazy about, and also just to know where should I actually dedicate my energies or not. Yeah, and to and to like make sure that you're not participating it too in it too, which yeah. I again I struggle with all the time. Like right. we are a progressive media company. I know when we put out clips where one of us goes on a rant about something, it's gonna go viral. those clips do better, yeah, right. <laughs> right? And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, great. We had a clip that performed really well. And it's like, you know, is the clip performing really well? Right. Is that the measure of success? Right. Because we're also trying, the whole purpose here is to try to persuade people mm -hmm. of a view. Right. <laughs> and, and persuasion sometimes takes a different set of strategies than just, Outrage. Righteousness right. and outrage. Right, and getting the people who already agree with you to, yeah. And it's not always necessarily a force for bad. I, I try to spend a lot of time in the True. book on Me Too, on Black Lives Matter, on the um, the incident in Central Park in summer 2020, yep. because I feel like these are cases that show, and I think it's important to show it not just for the sake of like abstract fairness to the social media companies, because they are going to be fine, but also just because we do want to understand holistically both the good and the bad, that sometimes outrage amplification can be a force for good. Um, and social sanction, which is what we do to punish social transgressions that are not illegal but that are bad for the community, is a really important tool that has been democratized to a large extent by social media. At some point in the book, um, you sort of made a, a, you talked about the civil rights movement and uh, yeah. I, I do think there's a type of organizing that happens online, even when it's for good, mm. that it's like it's it, it, it's different. Yeah, it's 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 almost like too surface level right. and, and too and too shallow. Right. And in the civil rights era, it, when there was no social media, you had all of these different civil rights groups. They knew each other. They met with each other. They understood each other. They worked together. They argued with each other, and they did it in person. Mm -hmm. And that kind of strategizing, when you're mm -hmm. in person with people, when you're organizing for a greater cause, like you can't just you can't just do that online. Right. This yeah. This is research by Erica Chenoweth that I found to be so mind blowing. And she studies public protests, basically, and protest movements. And something that she has found is that from like the end of World War II basically up through like 2010, the, both the rate and the success rate of protest movements was consistently going up. And then all of a sudden around 2010, and of course we know what happened then, which is the widespread adoption of social media, two things changed. The first were that protest movements became much more common and they became exponentially larger. I mean, the masses that you could get out on the street overnight because you didn't have to do this traditional SNCC organizing on the ground that would take years. You could just, things could go viral for free on this platform that might be outside of the control of authoritarian governments. But the other thing that happened was that their success rate that had been climbing for so long suddenly plummeted mm -hmm. from like, I, I'm gonna get these numbers wrong, it was like 70% to like 15%. All of a sudden they started failing. And this is something that if you think back to the Arab Spring and basically every major protest movement since then, that might sound familiar. Suddenly there's a million people on the street, but it never seems to go anywhere. And partly that's because, like you're saying, the protest movements look much more impressive because there's so many people, but it's very flimsy because all you have to do is read the post and go outside. You don't have to have that traditional organizing structure that has been displaced by social media. And that has been really, it, that work doesn't happen anymore because it happens so quickly online and because this commitment is so low that it's very easy for things to recede and also because authoritarian governments turn out to be really good at manipulating social media yes. and they have the resources that even the best and the most skilled activist does. And you hear this from a lot of like Arab Spring activists who uh, 11 years ago, I had to do some math there, <laughs> 11 years ago were, you know, naming their kids Facebook or Mark Zuckerberg. And we're like, Facebook has brought liberty and democracy to our country. And then three or four years after that, we're saying, oh no, actually now that Facebook has really come in or Twitter or YouTube have come in and have started to play this really important role as mediaries in our society, they have spread this division and this fear and this conspiracy theory that has completely undone all the positive work that we were able to do through the platforms. Yeah, and I think you, on the political side, we're seeing now over the last couple campaign cycles, the most successful organizing, the most successful political persuasion is happening with within people's own social networks and right. with like right. traditional door-to-door -door gathering with yeah. people in person. Yeah. Like, so it's, right. coming, it's coming back around. Right. Um, 
Last question. How, how, what's your favorite way to unplug, uh, mm. particularly after spending however many years you have writing a book yeah. about the, uh, <laughs> the ills of social media? <laughs> so it, it's actually the, and I, I'm not the only one to come to this, the version of unplugging that I found most helpful is a like half unplug, where I spent a lot more time on just old style group chats mm. and have like a couple friend slacks. And I've tried to use that to displace, you know, when I open up my phone and I want to look at Twitter, instead pull up the group chat that has 30 friends on it because it's always activity. It's a good thing to kill 30 seconds at a stoplight. It replaces a lot of those feelings, but it's it's real connections. Mm. So it feels much more meaningful instead of that just like fake superficial dopamine rush. And you also don't have the algorithms and all these distorting features. So it's a much, I find it to be a much safer, healthier outlet that still allows me to be on my phone 362 hours a day. So I would recommend that really strongly to people who are looking for a way to like unplug a little bit. Yeah, I do a lot less uh, tweeting and a lot more talking about tweets and the news with mm -hmm. a group of friends on a text chain. Exactly. <laughs> yes, that's right. You, you copy paste it instead of getting outraged and we all on talk Twitter. About about it. We can, yeah. Or we get outraged to each other and we can talk about it and it's fine. Right. It's the Nicorette gum. Yeah, I that's <laughs> uh, Max Fisher, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on Offline. And uh, Everyone go buy this book It is and read it, especially if you've been listening to the series. It is fantastic. Oh, thank you so the much. The book is The Chaos Machine. Thanks a lot, man.